Alright, hello again everybody. Today we're going to continue with chapter 11, talking about section 11.4, which involves the vapor pressure of solutions. So we're going to look at the vapor pressure of the solvent versus the vapor pressure of the solution. And so we know that in a solution, the solute affects the solvent. So the solute, what's being dissolved, and the solvent, what's doing the dissolving. So let's um, explain that using an example. And while I find the right highlighter pen, you can check out my fun Bart Simpson cartoon. Yay! Okay, so let's imagine that we have two beakers. One contains water, our solvent, and one contains a uh, sulfuric acid solution. So we're going to say that's our solute and our solvent. What happens is the water particles, so if we have this in a totally contained chamber, water particles are going to eventually all go over to the, acid, the sulfuric acid solution, leaving nothing in the water and water and sulfuric acid over here. And the reason for that is because the vapor pressure of the solvent is greater than the vapor pressure of the solution. And so the, the um, solvent goes to a vapor state and the solution absorbs vapor. So this emits vapor and this absorbs vapor. And so eventually what will happen is this container, uh, the volume decreases, it's totally empty, and here we have water and sulfuric acid. And so what that leads us to conclude is that a non-volatile solute will lower the vapor pressure of the solvent. The presence of this sulfuric acid, once they are mixed, lowers the vapor pressure. And so it's got a lower vapor pressure than just the solvent by itself. And the reason for this is because the dissolved solute, so in our case H2SO4, or if you're doing like salt and water, the salt, it decreases the number of solvent molecules, which then lowers the escaping tendency of the solute molecules, which then decreases the vapor pressure. So instead of just solvent molecules, you've got solvent and solute mixed together. And we can represent this relationship using what's called Roux's Law. And so we have the, the pressure observed of the solution is equal to the mole fraction of the solvent times the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. So that's why we have this zero right here, meaning pure solvent. And this is a linear relationship, and so we can, it's going to plot on the line. And we can use on um, this idea of vapor pressure lowering to experimentally determine molar mass using Rulet's Law. If you look back at Rulet's Law, it involves the mole fraction, and so we can use that information to eventually find molar mass. And we can also use this information to characterize... And we can also use this information to characterize solutions. So we'll talk about this a little bit more detail later, but if you look at like a saltwater solution, uh, it lowers the vapor pressure approximately twice as much as it would be expected. And this is due to the fact that because salt is ionic, when it dissolves in water, it dissociates into two ions per formula. And we'll talk about uh, that in more detail later. Okay. Okay, well, right now we have been assuming that the solute is non-volatile and it doesn't contribute to the vapor pressure over the solution, which is why we've been able to use Roux's Law. But that's not what always goes on. And so sometimes we'll have non-ideal um, solvents and solutes. And this is if both the solvent and the solute are volatile. And then we need to modify Roux's Law to look like this. So we've got the total pressure of the solution, partial pressure of A, whether you want that to be your solvent or solute, doesn't matter. Just make sure you keep it the same for all the A's. So partial pressure of A plus the partial pressure of B. And then we can break these down. And if you remember when we talked about gases in Chapter 5, we've got a mole fraction of A times the observed vapor pressure of A by itself, plus the mole fraction of B times the observed vapor pressure of the pure B. And so we can modify this for non-ideal situations. But let's talk about some more ideal things. Okay, an ideal solution is one that obeys Roulette's Law. And we can have some slight deviations from this. So we can have what's called near ideal behavior when the interactions are similar, meaning the solute and the solvent are similar in chemical structure or somehow alike. So 
So we kind of think back to the like dissolves like stuff that we talked about. So and if a version of this is if the solvent has an affinity for the solute, so hydrogen bonds are involved, there's polarity, something where they're very strongly attracted to each other, then the tendency of those solvent molecules to escape is going to be even lower than expected because they like the solute, they're attracted to each other, they want to stay. And if this tendency to escape is lower, then that means the vapor pressure is going to be lower than predicted, and that's called negative deviation. Okay, well, if we have negative deviation, we can also have positive deviation. Okay, and so, which we will talk about in a minute. But when the delta HF solution is very large and negative, that's how you can tell you have a negative deviation. Okay, so heat of solution is really large and really exothermic. Okay, if you have your heat of solution is positive or endothermic, then you have what's called positive deviation. And we will look at examples of all of these. And the third case is when your delta H of solution is zero. And this is ideal behavior. The liquids are very similar. There's no pulling one way or the other. Okay, so let's look at some examples of all of these. So let's see here. I don't want red. That's boring. Okay, so let's look at an example of negative deviation. This is where there's a strong attraction. Well, here we have acetone. And um, we've got some lone pairs on the oxygen. So we've got some polarity here. Okay, there's definitely a pull. And then we also have water. Well, water's also got some lone pairs, and it's got hydrogen bonds. And so there's going to be a strong attraction between these, and we're going to get negative deviation. And let's look at the opposite, which would be positive deviation. So if these are strongly attracted, these are not so much. So here we've got ethanol. And as you can see, it's got a hydrogen bond. Otherwise, we've got a couple carbons, uh, so a little bit of polarity. If we look at this one, which is hexane, we've got a long carbon chain, no polarity. So these are different in structure. And so we've got what's called positive deviation. Now let's look at ideal behavior. Okay, this is called benzene. And sometimes instead of writing all the carbons and hydrogens, and as you can see, we've got double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. We will sometimes write benzene like this. And so then we'll draw three lines showing that the double bonds are moving around. Or sometimes, if you're really lazy and you don't even want to write that, you can draw a circle because we're showing that the double bonds are changing positions. Okay, so this is benzene. And here we have toluene. And the only difference between benzene and toluene is this one CH3 group. So we're going to consider these to be pretty identical in structure, which means that their delta H of solution is going to be zero, and or close to, and we have what's called ideal behavior. Okay, uh, next we'll continue with colligative properties, so um, come back next time.